In the middle of the night, I go walking in my sleep through the jungle of doubt to the river so deep. I know I'm searching for something, something so undefined that it can only be seen by the eyes of the blind in the middle of the night. Yeah, a lot of you know that song. I want to welcome everybody that's joining from all of our locations. How are you doing? Is everybody doing all right? Good to see you, Crossing Church. Why would I play that song in the middle of the night? Well, I want to tell you a little backstory. You know who that is, don't you? That's Billy Joel. And that was the last album, the last new album that he produced back in 1992. His wife, Christy Brinkley, his wife at the time, did the cover art for that. And uh, he was uh, motivated to write that song because of a previous song that he wrote. And he was motivated to write that previous song because of a conversation he had with his little girl. See, he was tucking her into bed one night. And she looked up at her daddy and she said, Daddy, where do people go when they die? And what happens when we die? And Billy Joel had no idea. And so he wrote a song called Lullaby that really didn't answer the question. And that was followed by this song, River of Dreams. And let me read to you the three verses of that song. Listen to the man's heart as he shares with his daughter. Even though, and even though I know the river is wide, I walk down every evening and I stand on the shore and try to cross to the opposite side so I can finally find out what I've been looking for. Verse 2, I don't know why I go walking at night, but now I'm tired and I don't want to walk anymore. I hope it doesn't take the rest of my life until I find out what I've been looking for. Verse 3, I'm not sure about a life after this. God knows I've never been a spiritual man. Baptized by the fire, I wade into the river that runs to the promised land. You know, I think that's just so sad. It's just so sad that a man goes into the bedroom of his little girl and she asks him one of the most profound questions she could ever ask. And a father is completely incapable of answering that question. I think that's just incredibly sad. And why is that true? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Listen to what he says. It says, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Listen to these next words. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It means the reason that Billy Joel doesn't have an answer to that question is because he has no way of understanding that que- that the answer to the question because it is the Spirit of God inside of a person who gives him the ability to answer that question. People outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is a mystery to them. What, is, what does happen when I die? I really don't know what happens when I die. But look up at verse 10 of that same passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.10, it says, But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. Here's what I want you to see and what I want you to know today about the Lord and this relationship. We've talked about before and after. Before I have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, these are the realities of my life. And here's some good questions to ask. And this is going to bring you to a point. And when you come to that point, you're either going to go this way or that. You're either going to cross the line and you're going to say, I want Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Or you're going to say, no, not now or not me Or I'm just not interested in that. But if you do cross the line, here's one of the first after things that happens. You can know life's most important things. After you choose Jesus, you can know life's most important things. It only comes through an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And by His Spirit, when when you accept Christ into your life, His Holy Spirit comes in and begins revealing things to you that people outside of that relationship with God have no concept of, all right? And I want Chris Lefevre to talk to you about this today. 
Let me tell you, there's a lot of reasons why. But I just want to tell you just quickly about uh, just a little synopsis of, of his story. He'll tell you more later. But uh, uh, he, he walked away from the Lord and, uh, and stayed away from the Lord a while. And, and uh, Laura Lefevre, his wife, uh, decided she wanted to come and check out the crossing. And she uh, coerced uh, Chris to come along with her. And uh, so they came to church together, and Laura was all excited about hearing, uh, hearing and, and being part of that service. And I was preaching, and uh, I got to, to a particular point of the service. I was talking about Jesus and what Jesus is and what Jesus does. And I said, you know what? We need a, I need a kung fu Jesus. That's what I need. I, need a, I just need a kung fu Jesus. And what I didn't know was that there was this guest, this visitor... That was over in one of the sections named Chris Lefevre who was going, that's about the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard. <laughs> While he was thinking that, his wife Laura was going, this is like one of the most profound, wonderful things I've ever heard. So when he walks out, he's all locked and loaded to talk about how pathetically awful I was and how pathetically awful the church is. And then she just starts gushing about how great it was and how life-changing it was. And he didn't have the heart to tell her what he really thought. And so they came back the next week. And when they came back the next week, by the end of that service, he was at the steps. You know, after that, and he had a good job, but, at, but after that, uh, he started moving in toward, toward the direction of ministry. And it wasn't terribly long after that that he was the assistant children's minister. And then he became the children's minister. And then he became the discipleship pastor, and he completed MDI, and now he's the campus pastor of the 48th Street location of The Crossing, and doing an incredible job. I want to introduce to you a guy who has a great golf game and an incredible voice, Chris Lefevre. Would you welcome him? I don't think I'm, I'm ever going to live down Kung Fu Jesus. I... I've told him before that someday when I'm about 75, I'm going to have a little country church, and my first sermon series is just going to be titled Kung Fu Jesus. It's going to be awesome. Thank you, church. Thank you for that welcome, and thank you, Jerry, for all your words. Uh, uh, I, don't, I think I'm probably not the only person in this room that, that uh, has so many wishes to thank God for this church and the, and the difference that it's made uh, in not just my life, but in my family's life. Um, so thank you. I get a chance to be in front of you and actually thank you. Thank you for that. Like Jerry said, we've spent about six weeks now talking about what it looks like before we have a relationship with Christ. And this is the first week where we're going to look at what it looks like afterwards. So I'd like to start tonight in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 through 27. And it says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glorious riches of this mystery, that's Christ in us. You see, before we allow him to be our Lord and Savior, we have no clue what it's like to have him in us. But afterwards, we can start to get some answers to questions that, that might have been plaguing us for our whole lives. The first question that we naturally ask is, who am I? Now that I have Christ in me, who am I? And you see, there's one thing that, that each one of us is an expert on, isn't it? And that's ourselves. Every single person sitting in one of these chairs you are the expert on yourself. The only person that knows you better than you is God. But right now in this room, you're the expert. So let's look at Galatians 2.20 to see what that, the, the answer to that question of who am I after I, I accept Christ into my heart. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, because this mystery has been defined of who I am, 
we find out that the real answer to that question is irrelevant, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter anymore who I am. Who I am makes no sense because I've died and he's taken my place. See, it's more about who's in me than about me. I remember what Jerry was talking about. Like, I was 14 years old. I was baptized when I was 10. When I was 14, I went to a CIY conference and and I gave my life over and said, I want to be in ministry for my life. And I felt that call on my heart that that's what God wanted from me, to be, to be in full-time ministry for my life. I remember being part of my youth group after that, and, and, uh, and there was just like a slow fade that took place. And I, I grew up in church. My mom and dad made sure that I was there every weekend. And by the time I was a senior in high school, I had a job, and, and I was doing my own thing, and I was far off. And I remember I just decided that not only was this Christian life very hard and and impossible for me to try to live up to, I was just going to walk away. I stopped going to church. I started doing my own thing. I got married at a very young age. I had children at a very young age. And then I started to build a life on the foundation of Chris. And we talked about that foundation last week, the the rock of Christ and the sand that fades away. And I built mine on the foundation of Chris. And I built up a decent career. I think the people that I interacted with probably thought that I was successful. They probably, even the world might have even looked at me and thought, man, he's a decent father. He's a decent husband. He's a good businessman. Makes good money. People thought highly of me in the the business sector and and my boss, my boss loved me because I brought in a lot of money for him. But I started to surround myself with all kinds of relationships that were very self-serving. What would get me to the next rung? What would bring me up higher? What would make me better? And it was all about me, my prestige, my money, my power, my happiness. As life started to get a little harder and I started to realize that there were some things that I still wanted because when you have that mindset that it's all about you, you can never have enough. And I wanted more. And as I wanted more, the rain started to come. Things became difficult. And this fortress that I thought that I had built was on shaky ground and it washed away and I lost my family. I lost the respect of my kids. I lost the respect of my parents and my siblings and the people that I worked for and eventually lost my job. I was a 30 year old man living at my mom and dad's house, staying in the basement with nothing. And I remember my mom just praying for me. And what I didn't know is that she had been praying for me for 13 years every day. And uh, I was sitting at her kitchen table, and I was starting to try to get back into this relationship with Christ, because up to that point, I was thinking, man, I've just done so much, there's no way that this can happen. And I got into my word, and I was sitting there eating a bowl of soup, and I remember where the idea that it needed to be less about me, and it needed to be all about him, started to come into me. And I looked at my mom and I said, you know what? I have very little left. And what I do have left, the bill collectors are probably going to come and take it. But I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. And no one can take that. And since then, I, I mean, I, it would take a while to tell you that story. But uh, just to see where God's moved in my family's life and my life has been uh, Unbelievable. But we've got to grasp this concept of intimate personal relationship with him and then how that outflows, how that comes out of us to others. Now, for just a couple of minutes, all the single people who are in the room, I don't want to lose you because I'm going to talk about relationship in marriage and with children. But I want you to relate that to your folks, how you relate with your folks or even their, your folks' marriage or, or if you're hoping to be married one day, then what this looks like. But the first relationship outside of ourselves 
and that relationship with Christ that's the most important on this earth is our marriage. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 21. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Men in the room, I know that we've all read that passage before, and where we like to park is verse 22. Ladies, submit to your husbands. But I think if we really look at this passage as a whole, we'll find out that there's a whole lot more weight that we need to accept. So just for a couple of minutes, ladies, I would ask you not to elbow your husband as I'm reading these parts, and don't give him the glare. You can say that for the car ride home. That's fine. But just for a second, I think there's three things in this passage that men we need to take out of this and remember. And the first is, is that we are called to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Well, he died for her. He came down from heaven and lived a perfect life, and then he died for the church so it could exist and have relationship with the Father. And I don't think chivalry is so dead that most husbands in here wouldn't die for their wives if given that opportunity. And if you wouldn't, just, it's okay. Let that one go past. You don't have to admit to that one. But I think it, it boils down to more than just taking a bullet for your wife. Guys, there's things that, that we just naturally want, and then there's things that we need. And the things that we want, we need to be able to put those aside and see the benefit of actually just blessing our wives spiritually and raising them up. What would it look like if we put aside the things that, that we just feel like we have to have and started looking at how we could lift our wives up and bless them spiritually. The second thing that this passage talks about is that we're to be the head, which means that we are called to lead. So if your wife had to drag you here tonight to make you come, then you're not leading. <laughs> you're not even really following well. If you'll remember, about a year ago, Jerry did a sermon series called Man Up. And in that sermon series, we talked about some very startling statistics, one of which was that men, when they lead their home spiritually, 93% of the time the family will follow behind them. But if the ladies lead the home spiritually, only 18% of the time does the rest of the family follow. You see the weight that goes along with this, guys. The last thing is something that uh, is a little rough on us. See, we look at verse 22 and it says, ladies, submit to your husbands. But verse 21 says that we are supposed to mutually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Guys, we have a huge weight when it comes to the marriage relationship. And I'm not taking the weight off of the ladies. They, have, they also have a, a tough part, but we're called to lead, we're called to love, and we're also called to submit. What if we thought about the things that we could sacrifice for our spouse instead of the things that they need to change in order to make us happy? What if we stopped thinking about ourselves and started thinking more about him and what it means to have him inside of us? The next group of relationship that we have. We have ourselves and our relationship with Christ and then our marriage and then it comes to our children and the great mystery of children, there's really no definition in the Bible but it doesn't take much to look at children and realize that there's a great mystery involved there. My, my wife and I, we have six children and four of them are four, three, two, and seven months. And you would think with her DNA and my DNA and them being that close that these kids would be identical. You know, they'd be very close to one another. But we all know that's not true. Everybody has such, an, such an, a, a brand new personality. Each time they come out and it's just so different. 
And the beauty of children is that when we look at them, we start to get a glimpse, just a glimmer, a shade of what it's like to love the way God loves. Each one of us are his children. And when I look at my kids, I know that I would do anything for them within my power, not just to make them happy, but for the best thing for them, to give them the very best. And how much more does God love us that way? To give us the very best. He even loves our children more than we do. More of him and less of us. As we get outside to the next set of relationship, outside of just family, but we get to our extended family, we get to our friends, we get to the people that we work with. We think about what does it mean when Christ is in me and it's flowing through me into those other relationships, do they see him in me? These are all questions that we have to ask. But there's another group of people in the people that we know that it's important to identify today, and this is the hardest one for us. So let's look at Matthew 5, 43 through 47. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? How easy is that? What this passage is talking about is forgiveness. That when Christ is in us, then there's this, we have to start looking at others the way he does. And God loves each one of us the same. Even that person that been, you've been harboring ill feelings toward, he loves that person the same as he loves you. And he wants that same salvation that you have for that person. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, Chris? You don't know what that person's done. You know, you, this, the things that this person has done is unspeakable. I can't even tell you. You want me to forgive that? How am I supposed to forget what this person did? And that's where we get hung up, isn't it? We're not called to forget. We're called to forgive. Because forgiveness is every bit as much about us and letting that anger and those bitterness out of our hearts. So because Christ can't live in that, we have to let go of those things. But we're not called to forget. I promise you that if my four-year-old burns the house down tonight, that I'm gonna forgive him. But I'm not gonna buy him a four-pack of Bic lighters for Christmas either. I'm called to forgive. But that doesn't mean that I have to forget what someone's done. Don't get those two things mixed up because I think that's what keeps us from really advancing in this idea. More of him and less of us. And that takes us to the last group of people that we interact with. And that's the rest of the world. The people that we see on a daily basis that we don't know. The guy at the gas station, the guy at the grocery store. Let's look at Ephesians 6 and see what it says about that. It says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Every time I open my mouth that I'm making known the mystery of the gospel. We're called by Christ to tell others about this mystery. The last thing that he told us when he was on this earth was to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And surely I will be with you to the very end and teaching them to obey my commandments. And he promises to be with us, in us, as we do that. So the fear that we have of actually telling people about Christ is unnecessary because he promises to be with us to the very end. We've talked about our relationship with him and how important it is in a relationship as we go from circle to circle away from us, marriage, children, 
family, friends, coworkers, enemies, the rest of the world. Before I turn it over to Jerry, I want to leave you with one last thought. That is that a spiritually productive life is a life that reflects Christ in all of our relationships. A spiritually productive life is a life that reflects Christ in all of our relationships. It's not just our relationship with him, but it flows through us because he's in us. And it goes out to other people. We push for people to have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but it's never intended to be kept to ourselves. It needs to flow through us. More of him and less of us. Jerry? So we've talked about mysteries that are no longer mysteries when we're in Christ. Things that the world doesn't understand, but people that are in Christ do understand. What it means not to, for it to be about me, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. He is the hope of glory. How that changes all of my relationships. You know, in that Ephesians 5 text that Chris shared with you about marriage, he gets all done talking about wives and husbands and roles and all of that. And then he goes, this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. What he's doing is he's expressing the relationship that Christ has with his bride, the church. And we learn about that in our marriages. When he gives us children, what he's doing is revealing a great mystery to us of how he can love us. And we learn that as parents, that we love our kids, even when they let us down over and over again, we still lean into them, we still love them, we don't want to give up on them. And it helps us to understand the nature, the love, the heart of God. We see that even for enemies, and then we, we see that for the whole world. These are mysteries that are revealed in the Spirit, when the Spirit of God is in us. And right now, you're like me. You, we're going, oh yeah, I get it, man, that's awesome. Yeah, I get this whole mystery thing. I've got it all figured out, but there's a problem because I'm not doing it. Even though I may understand what the mysteries are of these relationships, I am still not adequately accomplishing that in my life. I mean, you, uh, neither are you, right? We're going, yeah, okay, in my marriage, but I'm going to fail in my marriage. I'm going to do things I shouldn't do. I'm going to let my spouse down and, and here with my kids. And sometimes I'm ashamed of losing my temper or this or that with my kids or, or, or any of these other relationships that go out. We're going, yeah, I'm a failure, but we're forgetting the first thing. It's not about you it's about Christ in you and if Christ is in you he's promising you he'll get you there you may not be doing it right now but you just keep at it and he's not gonna he's not gonna quit even when you do want to quit like Chris wanted to quit God never quit he kept right on going he could see this day. See, that's what's so beautiful about it. It doesn't just say Christ in you. It says Christ in you. And then it says what? Four words. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. You know how, where I get my hope of glory? Because of how good I am, right? No, because Christ is in me. Because he's in me, I have hope for glory. You know what glory looks like? Oh, my. Oh, my. I got a glorified body coming. I need it. This one's getting worse. You, and you're going, yeah, amen. Right? Oh, it, it, you know, I'm going to have a glorified body someday. And he's got it all worked out. He's got it all planned out. And you know what? He's got me a, not, not just a body to live in, but a place to live. He, he's creating a place for me. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God took six days to create this world, and we've already mostly destroyed it. And it's still got its beauty. He's been working on this place for over 2,000 years. That's why it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just before verse 10, that we read a little bit ago, it said this, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. I got a new body 
waiting for me. I've got a new house waiting for me, a glorified place. You know what? I'm going to be surrounded with glorified members of my family. That's waiting for me too. Some of them are already there thinking about my mom and dad. I was thinking about Chris being up here. I know Chris's mom and dad. I know his dad. And Chris and I have a lot in common in this area. We're both born late in our parents' uh, parents' life. Both of our fathers had Alzheimer's disease. Both of them uh, perished as a result of that. And I bet right now, I bet Chris is back there thinking, boy, it would be so nice if Dick Lefevre, my dad, could see me up here preaching to 6,000 people. And I can tell him he is. He is, because the Bible says, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. See, he's already traded in that old body for a new body, that old mind for a new mind, and that old place, the Alzheimer's unit, the veteran's home, for an eternal place of glory. It's all been replaced, and he's watching his son deliver the gospel message. And how wonderful could that be? It's awesome. It's awesome. Now, maybe... Maybe we can just get a little sliver of understanding the tragedy of a singer and a songwriter that goes into his little girl's bedroom. And there she is in bed waiting to be tucked in by the daddy that she loves. And she says, Daddy, what happens when we die? Where do we go when we die? And that father is stuck with the mystery that he can't answer. Because it's all spiritually discerned. When we come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you see, it's about a glorified body, and it's about a glorified place, and it's about being surrounded with glorified friends. But most of all, it's by being right in front of the King of kings and the Lord of glory, right in front of us, who makes all things new. And you don't have to wait until someday that you die to do that. That can happen right now. It can happen right now. When you say, I'm stepping over the line, and I'm going to give my heart, and I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. We're moving to a time of decision.